All right, so today uh, I'm going to be giving a talk on the FastAI API and U, applying a, a new and improved flexible framework to help you solve deep learning challenges. Uh, now your first question might be, who am I? Uh, my name is Zachary Mueller. I'm a leading expert on the FastAI framework, along with uh, having the privilege of being one of the main community leaders of FastAI. Uh, I'm also a fellow undergraduate at the University of West Florida with a major in software design development and a minor in environmental science. Now, what exactly is FastAI? Well, FastAI is a number of things, as you see here. Uh, at the center of it is Jeremy Howard and uh, formerly Sylvain Guger, who uh, sort of came up with the idea of FastAI. But on a whole, it can be summed up as a framework and a series of courses. Now, uh, what was Jeremy's sort of goal with FastAI? And uh, the quick answer is to make neural networks uncool again. Uh, if you look up anything about Jeremy, you might see this quote posted somewhere. And essentially what that means is allowing state-of-the-art uh, machine learning available to everyone, regardless of what your background is, and requiring the minimal knowledge possible so that rather than having machine learning isolated to, you know, these folks that have uh, been, you know, studying Cal 3 and differential equations and such, instead I can say, you know, I can be comfortable going up to someone who might be an environmental science major and say, take this one course and you will understand enough to make something potentially revolutionary to help out your field. And to do so, uh, Jeremy, uh, his partner Rachel, and Sylvain have uh, come up with a series of courses that uh, take the top-down approach towards uh, machine learning and deep learning rather than bottom-up. And what this allows is uh, you invite more people to get small successes very, very quickly. They can see sort of how it works. There might be some magic, but they can get some cool results very fast and this sparks their ingenuity and sparks their curiosity to have them stick around, stay, learn more, and grow to become extremely proficient in not only the library but the realm of machine learning. So far they have uh, four courses. Uh, the most recent release is Practical Deep Learning for Coders with FastAI and PyTorch. Uh, this is also a book that is also available for free. All of these courses are for free. Uh, Rachel Thomas, uh, Jeremy's partner, has come up with a uh, wonderful computational linear algebra course. Uh, she and Jeremy also together put together a course on natural language processing. Rachel just finished her course on ethics. And then uh, Jeremy also last year did a course on deep learning from the foundations, which focuses on a more bottom-up approach towards building a library, say, like FastAI or PyTorch uh, from scratch. Now, uh, one thing you might have heard about FastAI is it's fast. You know, it's uh, maybe caught some headlines such as train a image classification model in 10 minutes or in less than 10 lines of code. And uh, the way how they're able to achieve such ideas is to really lean into the bleeding edge of, re uh, edge of research. And uh, now the main question here is, well, the bleeding edge of machine learning is constantly changing. How do you know what really works? The point of the course is to encourage practical applications of AI. And so through this, uh, Jeremy encourages uh, his students to experiment. Go find a paper, try and implement it in fast AI, and see if you can recreate their results. And if so, try maybe a few special techniques that uh, Jeremy teaches and see if we can improve it. Some notable ideas that uh, were either sort of popularized by Jeremy and his students were uh, transfer learning across more than just computer vision. Uh, I'm sure most of you that have had a taste in NLP have heard of GPT and BERT and how they uh, perform transfer learning across the text domain. FastAI and Jeremy actually did it first through the ULM FIT model. Uh, along with the dynamic unit, which uh, was a project by Karim uh, Torgotu, uh, where he came up with it during the course, and that is a self-building unit model that can dynamically change based on the image input. 
Now, on top of that, though, uh, the library itself should be bleeding into uh, should be leaning into the bleeding edge, right? Well, notably, uh, FastAI has integrated uh, techniques that have made achieving close to state of the art extremely easy. Uh, for instance, test time augmentation, which has been shown to help improve the accuracy on inference, though it does come with a cost. Uh, the learning rate finder, so you can properly figure out beforehand what is the best possible learning rate for you to train your model with. The mix up data augmentation, along with integrating uh, state of the art optimization functions and make the whole interface for it extremely easy to use. A uh, little bit on this. Uh, last year, uh, well, actually with the new course and the new library, uh, there, are all, there are all these fancy names such as, you know, Adam, Adam W, RMS Prop, uh, Ranger. And uh, Jeremy and Sylvain were able to figure out that all of them essentially follow the same sort of pattern. And so one special thing that FastAI has been able to do is make a centralized optimi optimizer class where it's even easier to just plug and play new papers that come out into the framework. And it doesn't require you rewriting a completely new optimizer from scratch. Now let's go into detail a little bit more about that framework. So where it sort of sits on the software stack is FastAI is built on top of PyTorch, which is built on top of Python. And so essentially what that means is what you can do in PyTorch, you should be able to do in FastAI. So let's look at a few examples. Uh, for instance, say if I was trying to get predictions across an entire data loader, which would be a series of uh, images, potentially one, 200 images. In PyTorch, uh, the inference loop would look something like the top left. On the right, FastAI has a little get creds function. Let's change the game up a bit. I'm wanting to deploy my model. And so my inference code might look something like the left, where I prepare my transforms, I uh, sort of compose them all together into a pipeline, pass my image through, then convert it to a tensor, and then move it onto the GPU. And then eventually I have to also call my model and repeat what we did above. In FastAI, it's learn.predict, and it will automatically do that for you. The left is very scary to new people just getting into FastAI or just getting into deep learning and maybe don't have a lot of years in coding. The right is much more inviting. Now, FastAI has what it will call a layered API. And so what that entails is uh, every aspect of the data processing pipeline, essentially, can be fully customizable. If I were to sum it up in about five steps, you would first define what your blocks are, and these blocks would dictate your inputs and your outputs. So say if I was doing a classification problem, with images, I might choose an image block for my input and a category block since we want to predict a category. I would then tell FastAI how I'd like to get my data, split the data, and then how I would like to label it before finally creating a data loader object that has all of my data inside of it along with any image augmentations that might happen and uh, normalizations. Now let's look at a few examples because that's just images, but you know, there's, you've got text, you've got GANs, which is a very different problem compared to classification. How different does the API look? Well, the top we have seg uh, semantic segmentation. In the middle, we have what a GAN data loader would look like. And on the bottom, we have a text data loader. And all three of them follow the same general pattern. We have a block for whatever input or output we might want. And then we have a way to how we want to get our items, get our label, how we want to split the data, and any potential transforms or augmentations that we might want to tag along with it. By following this approach now, almost any problem can fit into this nice and easy to follow framework. Let's look at another example. How does FastAI successfully simplify the entire training pipeline? Well, I can create a model that can tell if something is a cat or a dog in 11 lines of code and have it ready for deployment, which means that you can, get, you can make a model that can uh, perform this and finish training in 
under an hour. Now, uh, for those of you that are Python sticklers, you might notice that we do from FastAI Vision all import star, uh, which is generally frowned upon. The way FastAI is built around is designed to really lean into this bad approach and make it a good approach. And then on the right, we can see just how easy it is to deploy a model. So we have load learner followed by that predict function that we saw earlier. And I will note that uh, the code on the left was uh, borrowed from Jeremy and Sylvan's new book. So the next question you might ask is, well, why do we have so much magic? And uh, because in some cases, magic might be very bad. Well, through intensive experimentation through humans, not necessarily through uh, Bayesian optimization or something like that, uh, Jeremy, Sylvan, and uh, the rest of his students were able to find some pretty good default parameters that pretty much always work for the learning rate, uh, the hyperparameters to set for your optimizer. And uh, what this allows is you can go from start to finish with uh, a pretty wide range of standard problems uh, without too much trouble. Now, uh, most libraries that decide to lean into magic tend to keep you at the magic, but uh, FastAI uh, with its layered API approach, you can remove more and more of FastAI's magic the further down the pipeline you go. To the extent of you can use a raw PyTorch data loader and a model, since FastAI models are PyTorch models, and you can only use FastAI as a training framework. And today we're going to walk through two examples, an image classification uh, model and a tabular binary classification model uh, to really sort of show just how easy it can be, how efficient and fast it can be, and uh, sort of the special tricks that FastAI has inside of it to achieve these fully trained models in under an hour. Uh, some further resources that I would invite you to read is there is a link to uh, the FAST book, which is Jeremy's uh, book. Uh, there is also my own uh, course notebooks, which was a Walk with Fast AI that I ran last year. Uh, there is also my new website, Walk with Fast AI, there as well, which has some neat tips and tricks. And then uh, lastly, there is the Fast AI forums, which I would highly recommend that if you plan on getting into deep learning and machine learning, you at least keep an eye on what goes on in the forums because uh, generally you can predict what's going to be coming in the future and become very popular just by taking a glance. Uh, now, before we go into the demos, I would like to quickly thank uh, UWF's AI and Data Analytics and Research Group uh, for inviting me to have this talk, uh, Dr. Bagui, the faculty sponsor for the club, uh, Jeremy Howard, Rachel Thomas, and Sylvan Guger for this library and giving me the opportunity to even learn any of this, and the entire FASTI and deep learning community because uh, machine learning and deep learning isn't really a individual sport. We all learn together through our experiences to help make everything more efficient and better. So now uh, I'm going to go ahead and run a few demo notebooks. Uh, I will also open it up to questions if anyone has any questions on what I just showed. But otherwise, the notebooks that I'm going to be going through are available at my uh, conference posters repo, but I'm going to quickly go ahead and throw this into the chat if anyone wants to follow along. Now I won't be training the models uh, since this is more of a demo and just to show how the API works. However, uh, after the talk or uh, during the next part of the uh, session, you guys can absolutely uh, run this for yourself. So as I mentioned, we're gonna go through an image classification example very briefly just to show what the API sort of looks like. And uh, the exact problem that we're gonna look at is the image wolf data set. Now, uh, one, challenge that Jeremy has attempted to solve is benchmarking models very quickly because there are, you know, big name data sets such as uh, ImageNet and CIFAR 10 and CIFAR 100 that are very, very 
that can get very, very long to train. And so ImageNet, ImageWolf, and uh, ImageLong are data sets designed to help give you a general idea of how your model is performing a lot quicker. Uh, each are subsets of the uh, standard ImageNet data set. So ImageWolf, as the name would imply, is a subset of 10 different dog breeds. So in this notebook, we are going to look at what it takes to install the library, go through this data block API, uh, see how to train a ResNet 34 model, and then introduce a few of those techniques like mix-up and test time augmentation that I talked about. Now, for any of you that are uh, recently getting into uh, Torch and Torch Vision and setting up stuff, you might notice that uh, they just released an update, which means that it will break all our CUDA drivers. Um, there, there's a wonderful library called Light the Torch, which can automatically install the correct versions of Torch and Torch Vision for you. So uh, this cell will simply just grab those libraries, install it before finally installing the FastAI library. Now at the current time, uh, FastAI actually has five submodules, Vision, Text, Tabular, Colab, and Medical. We're going to be focusing on the Vision sublibrary, and then the other example will explore the Tabular library. Uh, as a result, we will call from FastAI Vision all to go ahead and grab all of those relevant functions. And then let's go ahead and start working with our data. So anytime that we want to download data in the FastAI framework, we would call this untar data function and pass in some URL to extract. FastAI has some URLs already stored for us in this URLs object with some popular uh, data sets along with some data sets that FastAI uh, specifically teaches. So in our case, this would be the ImageWolf data set. And we can see that it's stored as a validation folder and a training folder. And if we go ahead and look at the folders and their names, while they're not entirely readable, we can understand that we would want to get the labels from the folders. All right, so let's start looking at how we would define the data block API. First, we'll define our blocks, which we get an image input and we want a category output. Uh, we get our items, they are all expected to be image files, so we're gonna say grab image files. Our, uh, how we want to split the data is between, uh, at a super level, the train folder and the validation folder. So we will use the, grand, uh, the grandparent splitter to do so. And then to get our labels, we want the parent folder of every image. So we can say parent label. Next, we're going to do some very basic augmentation. Uh, uh, then, just a quick question. What is sure. the grandparent splitter? Yeah, so the, the role of the, of the grandparent splitter is, uh, so normally we could say, you know, randomly split our data between 80, 20. Uh, that would be called the random splitter, which we'll see next. But in this case, we have specific training and validation folders that all follow this same sort of setup of we have the parent label in the folder. So the grandparent splitter will take two folder names, what your training folder should be called, and what your validation folder is, and split based on that. So we can tell FastAI, this folder is going to have all my train data, this is going to have all my validation data. There's a few different splitters that can work for most circumstances. Uh, this is just one example. Does that answer your question? I'm sorry. Uh, can I ask you where are the splitter containers uh, contained? Like, are them in one of those blocks you mentioned during the presentation? Are they part of? Repeat that one more time. Sorry. I, I was wondering where the grandparent splitter and the other splitters are defined, if they yeah. are part. Mm -hmm. So whenever we called this FastAI vision all, it didn't just, dot all is not necessarily just one file. What this will do is actually grab a series sure. of imports throughout the FastAI library. And so as sure, a result, sure. uh, now the actual splitters themselves, sure. So those are in the data, so if we go to FastAI here, I'm just quickly on their GitHub. 
and this should be under data and transforms. If we just quickly look at splitter, a random splitter that I mentioned earlier, we can find all of the splitters that FastAI has available to it. So random splitter, train test splitter, index splitter. We can also find this on the documentation website. So it will follow the same sort of pattern. So since this was data transforms, we can do data.transforms. This will bring up FastAI's documentation website, and we can go ahead and go to random splitter and find its documentation. Awesome. Awesome, thanks. Thanks a lot. Absolutely. So all, all these blocks, like you mentioned before, right, is all divided, everything has its own. Yep, exactly. And if it's not in the library, it's easy enough to integrate it in for your specific problem. Now, when we pass our data to our model, we need everything to be the same size so they can all go into batches. So we'll need some transforms to help us get there. So we'll have item transforms. These are applied individually uh, throughout the data set. And we have batch transforms, which as the name would imply, are applied to batches of items. The role of the item transforms are to perform any initial pre-processing to help get you to the batch. So in most cases, this would be making sure that all your images are the same size. And the reason why that's important is with FastAI, item transforms are applied on the CPU, while batch transforms are applied on the GPU, because it's a lot more efficient to try and stack batches of images into our uh, GPUs and run various uh, matrix calculations onto it. Now, what else can we do though? Because I mentioned that these are transforms. Well, normally we would correlate transforms with augmentation. That's no longer the case. A transform can be thought of as basically anything that affects something. So for instance, we had those uh, labels, right? Where it was like N0290, that's, that's not really readable to me, right? I have no idea what that means. And as its current state, if we were to say train our model, it would try and use this as our label name because that is the parent label. Well, let's make a transform very quickly that'll convert that into something readable through say a standard dictionary. So I'll make a label dictionary that just is able to take the name and convert it into something that's human readable. So if we, for instance, take an example of one item that is, this basically will go ahead and grab one path, one image path. Its current name is N029 yada yada. And if we pass it through a dictionary, it's a border terrier. Now, how do we apply this to the data block though? There's not exactly anything that says, well, before I grab my Y, or when I grab my Y, I want you to convert it. We can directly throw it into our get Y uh, through what are called pipelines. And this is exactly as it sounds. It's just a pipeline. We pass it through, starts at one end and goes out the other. So what I want it to do is anytime I give it a Y value, which it's going to get from the parent, I then immediately want it to go through our label dictionary. The data block itself looks exactly the same. And now we will get human readable names. So to build a PyTorch data loader from this, we would call block.dataloaders and pass in where everything is going to be expected. Because right now, this doesn't have any items in it. All this is is a blueprint of, all right, how are my inputs? How do I want to get them? How am I going to get my label? And any transforms I want to apply. The call to data loaders will then actually build the data loader objects themselves that we can train with. So here, since it wants either a list of images or a particular path to get our uh, images from, we will pass in the path of our data and how big we want to make our mini batches. And we want them to be 64 images at a time. Now, after we've built these data loaders, we can call show batch, and this will show us uh, our images along with their transformed label that we have. So we're no longer seeing this weird sort of blob of text. We can see that instead it went through that dictionary and applied the proper readable way for us to understand these images of cute dogs. 
Uh, this is a very useful tool to just make sure that you've got the pipeline all figured out and structured beforehand before you go ahead and start to train your model. And this will also show you any uh, image augmentations that you perform. So next, let's train a model. Now, most cases uh, you might, I hope not, uh, train a model from scratch. That's a very computationally ineffective way of doing things nowadays. Most of the time, you'll instead do transfer learning, which means we'll take some pre-trained model, uh, standardly trained on the ImageNet data set, and then chop off the last layer, so that last fully connected linear layer that actually performs the classification, and instead pop on a new head that we would say, okay, instead of the thousand classes that uh, ImageNet was trained on, we'd say 50 classes. And so uh, FastAI has uh, sort of leaned into this approach. So when we want to train a model, uh, you would create what we would want to call a learner object. This is uh, essentially what facilitates everything about training. And there are a series of underscore learner objects for each sort of sub-library. So here we're working with images. Images tend to be convolutional neural networks. So we have a CNN learner. And if we check its documentation, we can see what its function name looks like along with its one-liner. Now, FastAI deals more with one-liner documentations, uh, mostly because the actual documentation, which if we click show in docs, is much more verbose, and so the code winds up looking cleaner. So as we can see, it says build a convolutional network style learner from data loaders and some sort of architecture. This would be whatever model we want to use. So in that case, uh, also the arch is expected to be some sort of callable object, so not actually your model, but how to create your model. And that is the bare minimum of what we need to create a learner. So in this case, we'll call CNN learner, pass our data loaders, use the ResNet 34 architecture. And since we need some way for us to understand how our model's training, we'll pass in the accuracy metric so we understand the general accuracy of our model. Now, uh, another way that FastAI has leaned into the whole transfer learning approach is uh, we actually have a special uh, function called fine tune. Now, how fine tune works is when we created this CNN learner model, uh, model, right? We said that it took the base architecture and cut off the last layer, and I wasn't quite fully telling you the truth. FastAI doesn't just put the last layer on and just calls it a day. Uh, through some research, uh, there's actually a special type of head that is applied on top, so it's more than just one layer. And then what FastAI will do is create a splitter. And what this will do is it can understand, okay, what part of my model was that pre-trained backbone, and what part did I just add? And how transfer learning works is we would freeze that backbone because it's got all of this uh, pre-trained information that we want to leverage and just train that last few little sections of layers. This catches those layers back up with the weights and now we have a model that can be trained very, very quickly, leaning on the work that others have come before us. As a result, we can get a model with 94% accuracy in two epochs. And that is iterating through the entire data set two times. Now, the other thing that's happening here is uh, for this first epoch, uh, the weights are frozen in the encoder or that little backbone. Uh, before the second epoch where they are unfrozen. That's another little state-of-the-art uh, sort of new trick that Jeremy and Sylvan figured out through testing that if you're doing pre-trained models, you really only need one epoch to get the rest of your layers caught up to those weights. Now, what does inference look like? We saw that little learn.predict, but what does it return? Let's go ahead and pass one image in. So get image files does exactly what you might think. It would get all of the image files from a location. We're gonna pick the first one as our item. 
And if we pass it to learn predict, you can see that it output three different things. The class name, the class index in the entire array of all of our class names, along with the uh, softmax probability. So these all sum up to one uh, of our, basically what the output was from our model. Now, I also mentioned that FastAI has integrated other uh, cool techniques to try and keep up with state of the art, including mix up and test time augmentation. So for FastAI, the shortcut for test time augmentation is .tta, which will return these softmax predictions. And uh, for those unfamiliar, test time augmentation works by uh, gathering a series of predictions from our model. Uh, FastAI's default is three. One of those predictions will be the validation set. So any augmentations uh, that were maybe besides just simply getting our image cropped uh, are shut off. And so it's strictly crop, normalize, and roll from there. The other two or more up are uh, predictions where the transforms and augmentations, the training augmentations, are actually applied onto it. And so while it is more computationally expensive, uh, we're going to try and see how exactly that can improve our model's accuracy. If we want to get raw predictions rather than uh, get preds on, say, or on rather than learn predict on a series of items, we would call get prediction or get preds. In this case, I can call a data set index, which would, uh, and if we pass in one, we get the uh, validation data set. If we pass in zero, we would get the training data set. So if we calculate the accuracy based on these predictions, we can see that we get about 94.6%. Well, what about this, uh, what's called ensembled or averaged output from Learn TTA? Our accuracy improved by almost half a percent. We're up to 95. And so while it is more computationally expensive, it is a way for you to really push the bar on the accuracy you can get. Now, what about that mix-up I mentioned? Mix-up works by uh, taking, say, image A, which might be a uh, border collie, and image B, which could be a husky, and combines them together by splicing chunks here and there to where it's essentially a cropping. And uh, it's been shown that this can actually improve our model, uh, both its general, uh, both how it can generalize and its overall um, accuracy. And in fast AI, it's really, really simple for you to use this powerful technique. When we called fine tune earlier, we just pass in mix up as what's called a callback. And so as fast AI is training, it will go ahead and use this callback to set up and perform this mix up technique. And so through this sort of callback system, data augmentation, data pipeline. Um, it's really, really easy and efficient and effective to train close to state-of-the-art models without really having to think about it too much. So are there any questions uh, when it comes to training your first computer vision model? Awesome. If there are any, feel free to interrupt quickly, but I will go on to the second example then, which is tabular classification. Now, uh, the first was images, and uh, fast AI tabular is a bit of a different approach. It still follows the uh, general API structure. However, uh, due to the nature of tabular, it doesn't quite fit the whole data block API yet, and uh, you'll see why. So uh, first, we're going to install the library, as we saw very quickly in the other notebook. And then considering it is a tabular problem, we're going to import the tabular library. Now, the data set that we're going to use is the adult sample, which uh, the goal is to figure out whether someone makes above or below $50,000 based on relative information about that person and maybe the household. So we will call uh, FastAI's untarred data function again and pass in the URL and load it into pandas. Now if we look, here's our data set. 
Now, to work in Fast AI, and in general, when you work with tabular data, you need to define your category names, your continuous names, and something Fast AI does a little differently is uh, we'll actually pre-process your data when you pass it in. So we need to pass in what we would call our preprocessors or transforms. In this case, it's categorify, fill missing, and normalize. Categorify sets it up to the categories for our cat names. Fill missing takes care of any missing variables in our continuous values. And normalize, as you could imagine, normalizes our continuous variables. And then lastly, we need the name of our Ys which for our problem is the person's salary. Now, remember how we had that grandparent splitter? Uh, in Fast AI, we have another one that's called random splitter. And what we can tell it is what percent of my data is going to be randomly selected as the validation. We want about 20%. And we can pass in a seed if we want to, to make it reproducible. Now, underlying sort of what uh, Fast AI does with these splitters is it will, create indexes into our data set of what goes where. And so we can do that beforehand by uh, passing in the relative range of our data frame. Now what this range of function does is simply indexes from zero to n of our data set. So in our case, if we had 26,000 rows, it would uh, create an array of zero to uh, 26,000. So here, when we call our splits, we get two splits, one of roughly 26,000, the other of 6,500. And might not take you too, much, uh, too long to figure out, hey, that's about 80%. Uh, that's probably our training data set. That's about 20%. This will be our validation data set. Now, we're going to look at the highest level API here, which is this tabular data loaders from data frame. Uh, FastAI also has uh, for instance, I believe it is uh, vision data loaders from data frame um, and text data loaders from data frame and, uh, and from wherever. So here we would pass in our data frame, the preprocessors we want to use, our category names, continuous names, how we want to split the data, and where our labels are. Now I'm more a fan of the mid-level API, which is the tabular pandas, uh, along with the fact that it's a bit more easy to handle uh, for, in my case, and use, it can actually be used across libraries. So I can pre-process my data with tabular pandas and then say, go use it on uh, XGBoost or on random forests. And then we can create our new data loaders again by calling two dot data loaders and pass in our batch size. We can use a higher batch size here because uh, tabular data is not as computationally, um, not, not as much of a beast to uh, calculate and train as compared to say images. Now, as we had CNN learner, uh, we have tabular learner, which will generate a fully connected neural network that is usable by our data. Uh, and the only thing we have to pass in is how big those hidden layers should be and how many of them there are. So in our case, we will use two layers that are roughly 200 and 100 in size and pass in the metrics of accuracy. Now, uh, as previously mentioned, we brought up the uh, topic of optimizers earlier in the meeting. And how hard is it to integrate this optimization function into FastAI? When you create your learner, it's as simple as passing it in as your opt function. I'm a big fan of Ranger. It's uh, performing very, very well for me and has for the last year. It's a mix of two state-of-the-art optimizers, Adam W, along with the look-ahead uh, algorithm. And so uh, I'm gonna show an example of us using it here with a different fit function. So here, uh, Ranger is paired with the fit flat cosine uh, function, which is different than say fine tune. And what each of these different fit functions do is internally there is a learning rate scheduler that it will follow. So for Ranger, we found that say going at a pretty high learning rate for a decent amount of time before dropping down uh, worked very well. In the case of say the one cycle policy uh, that Adam is generally trained with, uh, you would start at a low learning rate 
increase it at a peak before gradually going back down. Uh, that is what's called the warm up. And uh, both work very, very well. I've had good success with Ranger. However, my backup is always Atom. And we can pass in how many epochs we want to run through along with the general learning rate that we want to uh, explore with. So here we will train with a learning rate of four, uh, 10 to the negative four, or four times 10 to the negative three. There we go. Fit for a few epochs and we get about 83 to 84% accuracy. State of the art of this data set is about 87% and that's not using a neural network. So that's a pretty good job. And just as we saw with the previous uh, problem, to predict, it's as simple as learn.predict and pass in some row of data. The output will be your input row, the probabilities, and the class index, which we can convert back into a readable name just by calling and looking at where in the vocab that what that particular index is. So are there any questions in regards to FastAI, FastAI Tabular, or uh, FastAI Vision, or in general? Um, what kind of learners are available? So we've seen the Tabula learner, which can do um, classification on Tabula data. Mm -hmm. And we've seen the one for classif uh, classifying images, but which um, other data, uh, which, uh, Sure. Like, like what? Like what are other uh, learners that are available to so do different the tasks? CNN learner and the tabular learner wrap around all vision problems, the exceptions being GANs. So classification, regression, uh, all can wrap around this sort of CNN learner module. Uh, it dictates the path. It dictates what it's training for based on your data instead. Uh, there is the tabular learner, you have the CNN learner, you have the text learner for uh, classification and language models. And there is also the collaborative filtering learner, which uh, deals with collaborative filtering, which is a different problem in its entirety. All right. And if we, for example, take the CNN learner, we can fit in most standard network architectures, for example, the, the ResNet or uh, VGG or uh, UNet or something like that? Absolutely. So with the UNet, uh, FastAI actually does have a special UNet learner. So if I go to the documentation real quick and look at the UNet learner, which we can find right here. FastAI has a special learner for semantic segmentation that comes through the UNet and it will build that dynamic unit I brought up earlier. And you can see an example of it right here. All right. Uh, could I use um, a CNN learner also to do semantic segmentation or just a unit one? Uh, unit is geared towards semantic segmentation. If you wanted to use a specific model, you would instead pass it more into learner, which is the base class that everything is called on. Now, that being said, uh, in the Walk with Fast AI website I mentioned earlier, which uh, is the goal of what I had for Walk with Fast AI is to be a culmination of cool resources and techniques for people to use. One of the articles, uh, which is under external model integrations and is called Tim, allows you to use uh, Ross Whiteman's uh, Tim library, which is a collection of pre-trained models all across PyTorch and use it in exactly how you would expect. So if I wanted to say use the efficient net uh, model and I was using uh, this sub library, I would call Tim Learner, pass in my data loaders and the particular architecture I would want. Otherwise, if it was just a raw PyTorch model, I would call the base learner class and pass that architecture. So that's the importance of why Fast AI is built on top of PyTorch. Okay, I don't have any more questions. Um, what about the other people? I will have a, a couple of questions, Zach, for you. Um, sure. do, you do you think it, it will be possible to load a model um, 
an ONNX model? So the way how Onyx work, works is it's C++ models, or it's a C++ sort of uh, language, and so mm -hmm. that doesn't work with Python very well um, if you're not wrapping for it appropriately. I have my own sort of sub-library uh, called Fast Inference that can help deal with Onyx and uh, will help convert FastAI over to Onyx. Okay, that's, that was my... So yeah, you, you generally you wouldn't per se train with Onyx here, but you can absolutely convert FastAI over to Onyx because you can convert PyTorch over to Onyx. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Makes sense. And another question is more about the community. How is it structured? If I we can have some references where to look at. Sure. So nice. this is the forums homepage, forums.fast.ai. And in general, we have uh, separate sections based on the courses and general topics. So we have part one, 2020, which is for the newest course, part two, 2019, FastAI users for general people using the library with questions or ideas, deep learning, a sort of catch-all. And what makes uh, the FastAI forums very special is Jeremy worked very, very hard and diligently to make sure that it's a positive environment. And so the rule of thumb is there is no stupid question. And 99% uh, of the time, the question might have already been asked on the forum. So definitely search before you feel like, you know, asking something just to make sure it is new. But um, it really is a great knowledge bank of uh, information around the Fast Data Library and PyTorch in general. And it's built in such a positive way that uh, beginners and experts alike can sit here and come learn. Uh, for instance, just recently this year, we actually have what is probably the youngest member that has ever done machine learning in general, or even fast AI. He joined the forums. He's 12 years old. And I'm comfortable with the environment that he's in because we are such a welcoming community. Along oh, with that, that's really good. Sounds really good. Along with that, we have a Discord. Uh, for the uh, FastAI community as a whole. Uh, this is more of a sort of sit here, chat, think about ideas, talk about maybe the course or any study groups you have. Uh, so it, it's, the community has definitely grown over the last two years that I've been a part of it. And I'm very excited about where it can go in the future. Awesome. I will have one last question. Um, do you know if there are like just out of curiosity um, any company that is using fast AI in production? Sure. Uh, big names that come to my mind. I know Intel is using them. Uh, Stack Overflow uses it for uh, hate speech detection. Uh, if, wow, any nice. of you are, if any of you are in, uh, familiar with the Camera Plus smartphone app, they use it. Uh, so does Adobe. And so FastAI is really, uh, oh, along with that, the United Nations is also using FastAI recently. Uh, they used it to help with uh, earthquake response time. Wow, for real? Yep. This was wow, a paper good. published in the last few months. I meant to have a slide on it. I guess they might have taken it off. But um, yeah, no, FastAI is a very quick and growing platform that is uh, being noticed by companies. Are there any more questions? All right, in that case, I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording uh, in a moment.